Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this afternoon's uh, get together about another topic, uh, and it's uh, solar panel and electronics recycling. My name is Ray Moreau. I'm also with the Southern Waste Information Exchanger, SWIX. Uh, I think most of you have gotten the knowledge from this morning's workshop about the bathrooms and silencing your phones and all that. But if you haven't, uh, the bathrooms are over here on the left and please silence your phones for uh, this workshop also. Uh, and welcome to uh, all our offsite Zoom people that I'm sure are on right now. Uh, we've got three great speakers in this afternoon's uh, session and our first speaker is jeff greg environmental manager with the florida department of environmental protection and uh, jeff is going to give us an overview of what uh, the state is involved with at this current time with um, solar panels and other electronics with that i'll turn it over to jeff Um, so before we start, we'll go ahead and tell you if I speak too fast, if I say something you don't understand, please raise your hand if you're here in the group. Let me know in the chat if you need to throw things, please do so, um, so I can communicate and we can get the information across. All right. So uh, as Red Ray says, my name is Jeff Gregg. I'm with Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I'm the Environmental Manager for the Hazardous Waste Compliance Assistance Program. Um, part of that, I served 20 years in the Coast Guard as a first responder for has waste, has mat, and oil. So I kind of un unusually enjoy this type of stuff. So we'll go through this and please, again, let me know if you can't hear me or if you have questions. All right. Um, so I'll kind of go over a description of some of the emerging waste. Um, specifically, we're talking about solar panels and electronic waste. We'll go over some again, more specifics about each of those. And try to give you guys an update of what's going on at the legislative level, legislative level, federal level, and state level. All right. Again, working with uh, whether it's a business, a regulator, uh, general public, most people know terms of has waste. Um, whether it's you know flammable, toxic, corrosive, they have an idea of what you're talking about when you mention stuff like that. Um, one thing we learn in this industry is that anything can be dangerous. So again, all things are poison, nothing is without it. It's basically built on your concentrations, your exposure. Uh, so again, how long did it take them to learn the asbestos, which was supposed to be the best thing ever, ended up being extremely toxic. So these are things we need to think about with these emerging waste streams. So the main one I'm gonna talk about today is PV panels, uh, photovoltaic panels, PV solar panel. Um, this is a big push both here in the US and worldwide as an alternative form of energy, because again, we have sunlight most of the time. Um, with these panels, they can be placed on tops of homes, they can be made into solar farms. You'll see this different location. So uh, power generation from solar panels increased 22% in 2020. And they're looking to a 3.6 increase for global electrical uh, usage per year uh, and a lot of these are projections, but it kind of gives us an idea of how we're looking at it for streams. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I give you guys the information as best I can. So I'm going the wrong direction. All right, so a typical solar module. Uh, again, some of this is information. So you'll learn that solar cells make solar modules, make solar systems. That's how it breaks down. And the panels can be various sizes based on the need and how they're being used. Uh, to give you a good idea, a utility scale solar farm needs about 30 to 40 acres of land for a five megawatt solar farm. And that can power hundreds of homes by itself. Now that's the good part of solar, solar panels. We know what they can give us, they know how they can provide us extra power. Now, what about the waste stream part of it? So anything you put into service will eventually reach its end of life, whether it's a shelf life, damaged by weather, damaged by some other means. And so you're looking, well, how do I get rid of it once I have it? 
All right, so some of the data I was able to find, a lot of this comes from the European Union because solar, solar panel use in the US is still a growing market and there isn't as much data as there is uh, on our friends across the Atlantic. So they're looking at, you know, a thousand tons, so a kiloton is a thousand tons. That's how much waste is being produced from 2020 to 2030. They're looking at 1 billion pounds of waste between 20 to 2020 and 2025. So where does all that waste go? What do we do with it? The goal is circular economy. You want to have it so that material being used can be reused, recycled at the end of life to provide raw materials, to provide new ingredients, to remake the same stuff. So again, some of the challenges. So again, you've got these opportunities for recycling the metals, whether it's glass, copper, aluminum, whatever may be in the solar panels and cells themselves. However, and again, the key challenge is you have both economical and technological delamination, separation of the parts. You've got the fact that you have hazardous substances in the actual panels. Now they're fixed because they're part of the actual uh, components of it, but you've got potential for cadmium, lead, uh, polyvinyl fluoride. Uh, a lot of these fall under, and I'll mention this later, what's called the RICRA-8 metals. These are under the hazardous substance, hazardous waste definition. So again, these are things we have to take into account that we're putting this out into our environment for use. And then what do we do with them once they're damaged or have to be repaired? <clears throat> All right. So technical and logical. I can't talk today. Technical and logistical challenges for managing infrastructure at the end of life stage. That's where a lot of our questions come from. We know how useful they are when we first put them in. What happens if we have to replace them, whether end of life or damage? So you've got your complex logistics, high volumes, materials often needed recovery from remote locations, and the presence of hazardous substances that I mentioned before. So what are some of the ways we can look at this? It has to be a coordinated effort. We've discussed this on various levels with various groups. It's got to be between policymakers, industry, and the general public. It has to be a circular economy approach. So you're looking at more eco designs, materially specific recycling targets, and something that, again, in the European Union and overseas is used a lot more here in the US is the extended producer responsibility schemes. Just like people who are installing this material have responsibilities, people who are manufacturing they should have responsibilities and the people using them should have responsibilities. Again, you're wanting to have it as a circular system. So right now it says designing for end of life could it improve the current 10% rate of PV model recycling. Uh, there's groups that are out there. Um, so a survey of US policies and initiatives, which um, these slides currently are not available because there's more information we need to add to them, but they will be hopefully shortly. And I'll make sure that Gene has a copy of these. All right, so let's talk about the recycling part. So you have a solar panel, it's end of life, it's damaged, for whatever reason, it's no longer usable. So what do you do with it? So again, you can break it down, Cutting and grinding, again, you have the silicon, you have the cadmium thin film. Again, these are things that could possibly be reused, but it's a process. And it's a process that we're still learning about, both at the regulatory level, the industry level. Um, the reference I, hear, I use here, International Renewable Energy Agency, they have a lot of information out there. I highly recommend looking at their website. They are the leading global intergovernmental agency for energy transformation. They talk about principal platform for international cooperation, supporting countries in their energy transitions, and providing state-of-the-art data and analysis on technology, innovation, policy, finance, and investment. So again, we're still kind of learning on this at the U.S. level, at the state level, but there are people out there, organizations out there that can help everyone in that stage um, have the data they need to make decisions. All right, so what's DEP doing right now? So currently in Florida, solar panels are considered um, hazardous waste if you, if you make a determination. So they're neither electronic devices or universal waste. Uh, I mentioned earlier the RICRA-8 metals. So you have 
The ones that we're more concerned about are silver, lead, arsenic, cadmium, and selenium. Now, there is a test called the Toxicity Characteristic Leaching Procedure, more commonly known as T-clip. Now, you can T-clip a panel to determine whether its levels are significant enough to make it hazardous waste if you want to test every single panel because there is no standard on by manufacturers. So the levels can be different per panel. Um, and that's again, that's why we're talking about a circular environment. You want to have a standard that everyone kind of follows. So you won't have to do as much testing once they reach the end of life. Um, let's see. One of the things that's not mentioned on the slide, but if you look into some of the regulations, there is an option of recycling these panels as they are. Uh, it's called a transfer exclusion base. If you as a generator, so you're a facility company with have solar panels that need to be repaired or replaced, they need to be removed. Before you determine that they are a waste, a solid waste, you can deem them as a recyclable material. That takes them outside of the RICRA. We're not concerned about the RICRA metals because it's a recyclable um, substance. If the recyclers say, hey, we're done for the year, we can't take anymore, then you have to make the waste determination because now it's no longer, a, it's now it's a solid waste and you have to determine, is it a has waste? So then do you just assume all of my panels are has waste and treat them as such? Or do I T-clip every single one and find out that of the 36 I have, three of them are has waste? Again, it's how much manpower, how much time and expense. So something that's going, currently going on at the federal level, <clears throat> excuse me, is November 2021, EPA was given a petition to reclassify solar panels as universal waste. No decision has been made yet. Um, we're still waiting on information from EPA from the federal level on how to move forward with these. Currently though, in Florida, they are considered a hazardous waste until you as the generator can prove that they're not, or if you deem to recycle them first, then they're not considered a hazardous waste. Does that make sense? All right. All right, our other topic. With a show of hands here in the office, how many are in the room? How many people have a cell phone? <laughs> uh, both home and work cell phones, laptops, uh, switches for those who like games. Okay. Anything that has electronic in it can be considered an e-waste, depending on what you're doing. Now, homeowners have different exemptions that they can use as a homeowner, but businesses, if you're updating all your computers, what are you going to do with the old ones? If you're you know, changing out that printer, what are you going to do with the old one? So again, some of these numbers, uh, 2016 was our latest study I could find, but they're saying that 44.7 metric tons a year um yeah metric tons that's a lot more than just pounds so i mean taking a look at it, that's how much each family generates annually so e-waste amount was expected to grow another 17 percent up until 20, uh, 2021 Again, there are no new studies that i could find there may be out there if you can find them please let me know uh so we can add this information to it um, big thing with e-waste, again, as they are being used, any of the, most of the hazardous material in them are fixed, whether it's in circuit boards, the screens, whatever. Once you take them as waste, they're going to get broken, shattered, exposed to the environment. Things can leach out, leak out. So you have to, they have stuff like lead and mercury in them. So how do we kind of fix this? Um, All right, so 2030, they're looking at 75 million tons of global e-waste. All right, so we are second place on generation of e-waste. Like this is one of the good things you don't want to be first at. Uh, producers of e-waste per capita. Again, we're third, but the Americas versus all of Europe. So being third maybe isn't as good as we would think. Again we are generating a lot of e-waste. Think how many different updates to electronics happen and they want you to get the next version. 
All right, three top three countries producing e-waste. Again, we're number two on that one. Six uh, six thousand nine hundred eighteen kilotons. Kilotons is also how they measure dynamite and atomic bombs. Is in kilotons. So again, e-waste solar panels they have impact. That's the thing I'm going to get across. They have impact, and this is an impact that we as regulators with the FDP industry. And as I call them, Joe and Joan Public, they have to be aware of this. We have to consider this to have a circular mindset. All right, so hey, 15% rate of recycling, not too bad. All right, maybe that is something to want to be second or first in. All right. Now, some of you in the room, some of you on the um, presentation may have heard of sham recycling. So, best place to go. I'll say it's EPA. They have all the details. So they have they have um, certification process that you can do as a recycler. That'll determine that you're not a sham recycler. So that way, if you are a business with solar panels and you're looking for a recycler, you have a resource to try to find those who are willing to take solar panels for recycling. A lot of companies out there, probably too many to name, will tell you, oh, of course we'll take your panels. Of course, we'll take your e-waste, but you need to make sure that they are certified recyclers, at least at the EPA level. Now, there have been some attempts to make some state level um, programs. As of yet, nothing's been able to move forward with that, but we'll keep you guys posted as things happen. Uh, but please just be aware that a lot of the push for these changes comes from the industry, come from the general public, from the, you know, the residents and citizens of the state of Florida or the state of wherever you're at. It's up to you guys a lot of times to push. So we regulators have something to regulate, right? You're, you're helping us help you. I know that's kind of a <laughs> cliche, but it's helpful. I and mean, it's like, we can only enforce the laws that exist, right? Um, as was mentioned, I think in the panel previously, we can't do anything until the legislative tells us we can't, right? We can only enforce those laws that exist. Now, one of the things for household electronics, I know that I mentioned earlier that household owners have a lot of different options that aren't available to businesses and industry, but still things you could look at. So you've got um, reuse, recycling, and donating of household electronics. You've got Earth 911, call to recycle, and what's called greener gadgets. These are all different options that you have that you can, as a homeowner, again, everything starts at home, right? So start there and maybe we can expand it larger. All right, so I mentioned this earlier, responsible recycling, e-stewards, e this is all EPA stuff. We at FDUP support these. We try to help people understand it better and we'll um, answer questions as best we know or we'll forward them up to the EPA, which for us is region four in Atlanta. We bring them our questions, they'll try to get us answers. I know one of the things with one of the program benefits, and I underline this specifically at the bottom, um, a lot of companies are concerned with proprietary knowledge, trade secrets, uh, again, being previous military, we have security issues with all of our documentation as well. I still say R, I've been out for five years, I still say R. Um, destruction of all the data on the used electronics, that's part of those certification programs is they've been able to confirm that any data that they receive on these devices is destroyed, not copied, not shared, but destroyed. All right, so current standards for PV recycling. So EPA has their solar recycling webpage, a lot of information. They also have a frequently asked question um, solar panel. Uh, for e-waste, the Division of Waste Management Permitting and Compliance Assistance, which is what I'm part of at DEP, has an electronic waste website various links, it has the most current legislative information, if there is any, excuse me, it tells you as much information as we have. Now, something else you'll be able to find when you go to these websites, especially the DEP website, uh, after the last hurricane season, we were able to generate up some documentation to give advice and suggestions on how to treat solar panels uh, damaged via storms. All right, this is something that we as Floridians have had to deal with with the push to transfer to solar as a new option 
we're going to see probably more of those type of effects. So again, never be afraid of contacting us at DEP. My department's called Compliance Assistance for a reason. So ask us the questions. We'll try to get you guys the information. And it's, again, it's circular. It's a two-way communication. If you ask us questions and we don't know the answer, we can ask EPA and that can prompt them to get answers. All right, I'm not sure if I used up all my time, but I will open it up to questions. Mr. Wright. Ray, Ray I have a question over here. Yes. Somebody signed in the Zoom. They said, is there a database with recycling companies that can recycle solar panels? That is an excellent question. Uh, so the best place to look is the EPA's solar panel recycling site. Uh, so within their frequently asked questions, they have links to uh, approved recyclers, uh, very similar to the same thing for e-waste. So the call to recycle, I'm not sure if call to recycle specifically has it, but EPA does have links to those approved by them to recycle solar panels. You're very welcome. Um, did, here's a little note. Be aware that some of these re, uh, recyclers do have annual maximums. So they can say, oh yeah, we'll recycle it in March. Then come July when you have the panels ready, oh yeah, we're done for the year. So just be aware that there can be limitations and there are currently limitations on the recyclers. Quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, do we know how many electronic recyclers, processors we have in Florida at the current time? I do not know that number right now, but I can try to find out and let you guys know. Uh, say again? Okay, we have one, so I can confirm we have one. Yes? Yes. Um, can you read? Yeah, go ahead. Repeat that one time. Well, you, so, he, Jeff. so um, what I was being reminded, uh, so Karen Moore with DEP as well reminded me that during our discussions after Hurricane Ian, we identified a list of potential uh, recyclers um, for electronics within the state of Florida. And we, if I remember correctly, it's like eight or nine. But again, if you go to the EPA links, you can search by site. I mean, not by site, by state. And that will give you those ones who meet the EPA certification requirements. And that number may fluctuate based on certification, operation, and then just businesses opening and closing. Well, and, and I may add to that as well. Um, again, um, there's eStewards and R2. Um, they are the electronic certifications for, uh, they certify electronic recyclers. And I would it, ask that, you know, you get take a look at those sites as well to, to see the electronic recyclers who are certified under those programs. And again, that was Earth 911 and Call to Recycle. Those are some of your sites you can use to find recyclers for electronics. We've got a question over here. And, and at that point, I, I will try to compile. I'll get with you guys. And I have got some other lists that BJ gave me some and, uh, of, of the folks that have been known to do this type of work. We'll make sure that we compile a list and get it out to everybody that's part of the workshop. Just picking up on the last comment there about R2 and um, e-stewards, is it either or, or do you have to go, if, if they're approved by one, they're good for the other? How does that actually work? That is an excellent question. Um, I will know that I think it's, they're separate. So it's, you can get one or the other or both, but you don't have to have one to get the other is my understanding. Karen's nodding her head. Yes, yep. it's separate Same confirmation. So yeah, that's my understanding from my research and discussions with the EPA. It's what you can get both, but it can be they're individually separate. Any other questions? So All right, hang on, Harry. Hang on. Let me hang on, Harry. Recycling of uh, batteries for electric cars is that covers under this, or that's a different program. I'm sorry, say that one more time. Recycling, Recycling batteries. batteries for electric cars. Oh, for electric cars. Okay. I knew this question was going to come up. Um, so EV batteries, electronic vehicle batteries. EV batteries are a, they are their own stream of waste. So something we just, uh, the DEP identified and starting researching into after Hurricane Ian was uh, the recycling of EV batteries. There are 
several uh, nationwide level companies that do EV battery recycling. A lot of it's on the West Coast, so you'll have to ship it via DOT standards to them. Uh, I believe there was one opening or scheduled open in Georgia, I think, that's gonna be doing EV, EV recovery. The question that comes up and is still being discussed on various levels is damaged EV batteries. So currently, if a vehicle is in an auto accident, a lot of times that's covered between auto manufacturers, repair shops on how, who's responsible for that battery. But let's say you have a flood event due to a hurricane. Well, the batteries are in sealed airtight, quote, for those who can't see it, quote, airtight packaging, not designed to be under water pressure. And then you have water introduced into materials that react quite well to water in the fact that they will self-ignite. So EV batteries have been identified as a hazard that we're trying to get more information on, but there are recycling of EV batteries. As I mentioned, I think the, early, the closest one might be up in Georgia. Uh, I'm not sure if that plant is online yet. I think it's being built. Uh, and then I, I identified several in Texas and California and some up in New York. So there is EV battery recycling as an option. I believe again, I think EPA would have the most current list of those. Okay. So Jeff, um, will the car manufacturers take them as well? I mean, are, are they typically the responsible parties who will manage that, the EVs? I'm gonna underline and quote typically. So um, with auto accidents, it comes down to, and this is my understanding from my research and conversations, of course, they won't give me anything in writing, but normally it is part of an agreement between the auto manufacturer and the mechanic shop. Uh, if they're taking the vehicle, if the auto manufacturer is taking the vehicle back um, as part of the damage recovery, they'll take the battery as well. So in the, it's one of those things where a repair shop may be one holding the battery now. Eight times out of 10, and this is me just making numbers as I remember the conversations, Eight time out of 10, probably the manufacturers will take them, but there is a good potential that a repair shop would be the one left kind of holding the battery and finding a recycler. Jeff, are they, are they covered to, under universal waste or hazardous waste? They are considered hazardous waste. Um, as of right now, even though they are a battery due to their size and their components and the potential for a fire hazard, they are still being considered hazardous waste. So there is that. Um, is EPA working on that also? It's being discussed. I don't know of any specific stance that EPA has done on it. Uh, they follow a lot of the standards talking with organizations like the National Fire Protection uh, Agency, the NFPA, talking with those experts on fire and these um, rather dynamic events that happen when water is introduced into EV batteries. So again, it's a concern that we at the state level know about, we're concerned about, we're looking into it, trying to get more information. And again, it's as we talked about with solar panels, even e-waste, these are emerging waste streams. These are new things. Um, trying to remember, I had it written down at one time, Karen, I don't know if you remember how many hybrids we identified just in the one county after Ian? 95,000 in the state registered, of which there's like 13,000 just in Lake County. Yeah. So within one county, you had 13,000 hybrid vehicles, 13,000 EV batteries. And again, these, they are airtight. They are designed to be safe, but they're also not designed to be underwater pressure. So again, these are concerns we're aware about. If you, I hate to advertise Google, but if you do Google searches, you will find various events from here, Australia, uh, European Union talking about water and the effect on EV batteries. Uh, there's some dynamic videos we even have here from Florida, if you search for them. In Florida, can do everybody one better with salt water intrusions. Yeah. So, any other questions? Nobody's still online? No. Okay. See, I've scared them all the way. Fantastic. They're on Thank there, there are just no questions. Well, thank, thank you. Thanks everyone for the opportunity to speak today. Hopefully I've been able to ed educate and communicate some of the emerging waste streams we have here in Florida and what we at DEP are trying to do and help with that. And then what you guys can do as industry and consumers as well.